Um, and, that, and with that, I'll introduce our two presenters, Tim Collier and Brett Lolly. Tim and Brett are colleagues at McAllister High School in Oklahoma, and today they'll be sharing their experiences planning and conducting a TI Innovator Rover competition. Um, thank you, Tim and Brett, for being here with us today. Thanks, Eric. Thanks for having us. Great. And with that, I'll go ahead and make you the presenters. All right. I want to share a file. Well, we're getting ready to do that. Uh, would you mind, participants, pop into the chat window and tell us, you've already told us where you're from, would you tell us what you do, like what your role is at school? Just a little bit of an introduction about us as we're working through this, uh, the process of getting the, the file up. Um, I teach this year at McAllister High School, I teach um, aerospace engineering, robotics, and coding. I teach Python, and we teach a little bit of Java um, in, in our classes. I've been teaching here at McAllister for about six years. Um, I've taught Algebra 1 and Pre-Algebra and Intermediate Algebra and 7th grade math and a whole long list of math classes for the last five years. And then this year got to jump over to the STEM side of things, which was really exciting. Um, how that kind of, how that process went and obviously really excited about uh, last year hosting this robotics competition uh, for the first time. Um, our hope is that we kind of give you some, some tips and some pointers on how to do this because this, our vision is this not to be something that just we do here in McAllister, Oklahoma. Our vision is this is something that becomes a, a nationwide thing. It becomes things that we're doing all over the country, all over the world. Um, and eventually, you know, maybe we hold, host a national comp competition or something um, in the same format. So, Tim? Well, my name's Tim Collier. I'm in my 33rd year of uh, teaching math. Uh, actually, the last 27 of them have been here at McAllister High School. Should I share the fact that you actually sat in my room as a student? I did about 15 years ago. I was I was sat almost in this same desk I'm sitting in right now um, as a student of Mr. Collier. And now I sit in your room learning how to do coding properly, which I think is a, a wonderful way that things could come full circle. Yes. <clears throat> Our first slide says uh, a hands-on look at uh, creating the first ever TI Innovator competition, maybe we should give the, the caveat that it's kind of the not quite as hands-on as we had planned. Uh, had we got to meet with you in Dallas, uh, we would have handed you a rover and worked with you through some of our, comp our uh, challenges, but that is not quite as possible as it is now. Uh, <clears throat> We still have uh, quite a few things that we're excited to share with you. Um, we, uh, as Tim said, we were going to have, we were going to kind of host maybe like a mini rover competition in our session. Obviously, uh, we can't do that here. So we're going to kind of just give you the nuts and bolts of how to create one. So um, this slide that Tim is showing you right here is part of the, um, the flyer that we handed out for our, uh, our, attendees for to, to promote our event. Um, we were uh, blessed with Eastern Oklahoma State College's Gear Up um, grant, Gear Up Department. They worked with uh, some people on campus and created this flyer, which was awesome because uh, I'm not a creative person at all. I'm a doer, not a, not a thinker in a lot of ways. So it was cool that they came up with this and we were able to use this for promotional purposes. And then we just have a couple of pictures of just some different things that um, different students, different activities, uh, different things that happened that day. Um, so just to kind of give you an idea of kind of what this looked like before we start kind of presenting the process. Well, let's see, we have a, a broad variety of folk in our group today, Brett. Yeah, very excited about that um, from all stretches of life and all places uh, around the globe, a lot of places around the globe, very exciting. Well, what you're seeing is just a few photos of students taking part in our very first rover challenge. Um, honestly, we were so pleasantly surprised to have the number of students that we had show up. Uh, 
we were going into this hoping to have six teams, and we ended up with about 35. So you see that if you're looking at the pictures, there's uh, some young students, some uh, older students. Of course, you're going to see some volunteers in here. The exciting part about our competition this year, uh, this past year, was we posted sixth graders all the way to 12th graders. And we'll talk a little bit uh, here in, in another slide about how that kind of came to fruition with far as results went. But I'm very excited to host that. And um, we threw this slide in here because we wanted you to understand kind of the demographics of what we're working with. Um, a lot of times when we talk to people, um, they kind of think, you know, you have all the resources, you have all the things, and, and we just want to kind of show where we're from. Um, we're from a very kind of um, average to below average income, um, small town southeastern Oklahoma. While we're the bigger town, the kind of the biggest town in southeastern Oklahoma, we're still very much a small town. Um, we have, uh, as you see a couple of stats there, we have about 774 students on campus here at McAllister High School. Um, we have about 120 that attend uh, alternative school and virtual uh, virtual school through our campus. Um, but the reason we put this in is because we want you to understand we're not from some big, fancy, uh, rich school district that has just tons and tons of money to pour in. We're from just a, a regular school district like many of you guys. Um, so we, the big thing for us is to provide encouragement for you to understand that this is something that you can do as well. Um, and that, that's a big reason that we put this slide in. It was important for us, for you to understand that, that you can do it as well as we can do it. So certainly, I believe that uh, some folks are looking at that slide and saying there's 774 kids on campus and that's a big school. And others are thinking that's a middling school and others are thinking that's a small school. Yeah. So it really depends on, I guess, your experience and point of view, but uh, we are uh, where we are, and uh, we'll talk more about how and why that we decided to to put this together. So we're talking about sort of our journey with the TI. We'd like to give you some sense of how we got to this place so that our decisions going forward will make a little bit more sense. I started with using TI handhelds in my classroom in the early 90s, and I've pretty much had them as a daily part of my experience ever since. And the exciting part about this is, as you see both sides of the spectrum, I've basically been using the TI in my classroom for about the last two or three years. Um, at the beginning of my career, about six years ago, I was very hesitant because it was just one more thing. And while I started, I sat through the training that we were blessed to have, I, I just, I didn't catch the bug until I did. I went to T-Cubed and I saw all the things that you could do with this stuff. I saw all the things you could do with the with the Innovator, I saw all the things you could do with the Rover, with the Inspire, um, with the Navigator, all of the stuff that we had. And I was like, I've got to get my hands on that. And, I, and I'll be honest with you, I don't think I could teach without it now. It's kind, of, it's kind of cool to see how that process has come from, you know, 30 some odd years to just a couple of years. And again, we tell you because, we tell you that because wherever you are on your journey, this is something you can do. We completely believe that this is something that you can do. And so this is just a quick little slide to show you kind of some, some uh, highlights of our walk through TI. Um, Tim attended uh, T-Cubed before I did, and uh, I got to attend in San Antonio a couple of years ago. Um, and then we hosted a sim camp. We started a robotics class. And then but, uh, Tim and I both got to present last year in Baltimore. And then we hosted the Rover Challenge. And then now we started the aeronautical engineering class and uh, the second year of the robotics class. Um, both of which have a heavy TI component to it. Um, we're very excited about that. The STEM camp is pretty much based in TI. Almost every activity we do has a piece of TI uh, technology. I know last year with my group, um, I took the high school kids and um, we did the pet car alarm project, but I didn't give them the code. I made them handwrite the code. And by the end of the week, they, they created it, they hand wrote the code, and in their, in their eyes and in some ways even improved on the code. Um, and I just kind of fed them bits and pieces, and they figured it out on their own. So it was very exciting um, how that how that process kind of went with the uh, with the STEM camp. And then well, that was two years ago. And then last year we took the rovers and we found found out that we could add to it, and we created a hydraulic lift on top of the rovers. And our kids engineered that and figured out how to make that work along with the rovers. So um, just really cool that through all of this, TI has been a big big piece. 
So enough about us. We wanted to share a little bit about how who, who we are, where we live. Uh, our real goal here is to be an encouragement to anybody who's thinking about doing a challenge for yourselves. Uh, we really haven't been involved in T-Cube that long. You see, I started, I went to my first uh, TCI3 in 2016, so that's four years ago. Uh, and I uh, have been able to get this thing, our STEM camp, and eventually this competition on its feet in, uh, I guess, a relatively short amount of time. So why are we here? <clears throat> we were a member of uh, a Gear Up grant from Eastern Oklahoma State College in Wilberton, Oklahoma. That's a little town about 30 miles up from where we live. We were included in this grant. Uh, in this grant, we got some Inspire handhelds and uh, the Navigator systems. And at the very end of the grant, in the last year of the grant, the rovers became available. And uh, the grant administrator saw some promise in this technology generally and saw some promise in uh, our school, the people in our cadre, of, of making something of it. So they provided us with some of the equipment coming in. That was a godsend. Without that, I think it would have been really hard to get started initially. We did find at the time, though, that our grant was ending, and we had had uh, just one half day of training on using the innovator and the rover. Uh, and I became concerned, Brett and I became concerned that uh, this equipment was going to end up in a closet never being used because I was a little concerned about the learning curve for teachers to actually implement. So we were trying to dream up some methodology by which we could keep our cadre together. And along with that, we saw a demographic in our school with our students that um, there was a handful that were in athletics, a handful that were in band, they were in handful that were in other things, and we saw a demographic that were interested in coding, that were interested in video games, that were interested in, in kind of that process, the computer sciences. And at that point, um, we, didn't, we didn't have anything to offer them that would satisfy, that would meet that, that need or that want for them. And we felt like this would be a very easy way, a very easy way to introduce coding, a very easy way to implement coding, to um, learn how to create and do some different things um, on their own. And, and we were really excited um, you know, we tried to we tried and failed to have a robotics class last year where we went and competed um, with one of the national robotics competitions. And part of that led to well, why we have robots in our in our cabinets? Why are we not doing something with that? And so we wanted to give those kids and just anybody that wanted to be a part of it the opportunity to to find their place essentially. And so um, we were really excited for this thing to take off. And, and honestly, had a lot of kids that. Um, participated for us that weren't involved in anything else. We, I mean, we had some athletes, we had some, some people that were in the band, some students that were in other clubs, but we had a lot of students that literally this is all they did all uh, last year. This was the extent of their involvement in a quote unquote extracurricular. And of course, uh, I don't think it would be overstating it to say that uh, the T-cubed mission uh, the, all, and all the pedagogy and teacher training that was involved in us being becoming involved in T-Cubed changed our department at a fundamental level. Like the way that we think about interacting with students, uh, the way that we think about interacting with each other, uh, how we share and what we share, what we talk about in staff meetings, uh, we felt such a responsibility to you know, the T-Cubed community for lifting us up over the last four years that we felt we really couldn't just let this equipment sit in the closet and go to waste. So we went to work trying to figure out, you know, what are we going to do with this? What is this going to look like? How, what could we do with it? Uh, given our experiences, our desires here to be a part of a robotics competition, and certainly our understanding of how valuable those kinds of experiences of, of learning logic, of learning coding, could be to students' deeper understanding of mathematical and scientific processes, uh, we just wanted something that was engaging, something to keep our, our teacher cadre together and something to uh, intrigue our students, to draw them in. Uh, so many of our students here in Southeast Oklahoma, especially when talking with their parents, 
have this notion that, uh, especially from the parents' point of view, that, that math and science is a bunch of worksheets to be filled out and something to be endured until they can get to what they really want to do. Uh, we felt like that we could offer them, oh, well, that business of what they really wanted to do. <clears throat> now, the part you came for. <laughs> Now that we've introduced ourselves and the why we did it, we're really excited to give you guys kind of, like we said, kind of the nuts and bolts on how to make this thing happen. And so um, we're going to kind of break it up into some small sections of uh, kind of the different teams that we developed and their roles, and then kind of how we did things the day of, um, how we planned on things, how we created competition or the competitions, all of the above. And so probably the one of the biggest pieces for us was how to get people on board, how to get volunteers and participants, because um, the planning committee essentially for us was about four people. There were us, uh, a STEM teacher, and a geometry teacher that helped kind of plan um, this, and we knew that the four of us could not make this happen on our own. So we knew we knew we needed to reach out. And so obviously the first step um, with this and with anything else is reach out to your administration, reach out to your principal, and kind of uh, see where they are on it. And luckily for us, our our principal, our our school board, our superintendent, um, everybody in an administrative position. They're all about implementing technology. They're all about um, kind of being innovative and being ahead of the curve. And so they were all about um, being a part of this. And because of that, um, five of our judges last year were actually our five school board members. And we were really excited for them um, to come be a part of that. We also tapped into to our gear up coaches. We tapped into um, some other guys that worked with the kind of the creating the rover and creating some activities for the rover and, and really just tried to take all the ideas that we could come up with and really try to um, focus them in on what kind of kids we thought we were going to have there. And so we, we utilized that, we utilized uh, STEM teachers, um, and we felt like um, we needed to also talk to parents and people in the industry uh, that related to this kind of technology. Brett, I noticed there's a question in the chat about uh, a list of rover commands, and which ones are queued and which ones are done immediately. Okay, so uh, a good, a good place to uh, go to learn, I'm, I'm assuming you're asking how to code the rover to make sure that I, I understand that correctly. Um, we started with 10 minutes of code. Um, every time that I teach coding, we start with 10 minutes of code. Um, we work through, uh, at the time, the 10, the 10 units since they've added the, the drawing and the RGB array, but there were 10 units at the time. We worked through every one of those units, and I kind of created a, uh, an extra little task at the end of one of those units. and that has been the springboard for everything that we've done coding-wise. And in terms of that list you're looking for, I believe it's available on the T-Cubed website or uh, education.ti.com. There is a, um, in the download section, I believe, I'm sharing a file now so I can't open my screen, but there is a, uh, a list of all the commands with their, with their syntax. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that document Tell us which ones are queued or which ones are done immediately. Yeah, I'm not uh, sure yet. And then the other question that's in the chat right now is, have there been changes in Rover and Launchpad since it was first released? Uh, yes, there have been at least two, or have there been three sketch updates for the Innovator? I think there's been at three since they've been released. Of course, the Innovator is what drives the Rover, so there have been uh, you might remember that when the rover first came out, if you were programming, there were some commands that were grayed out. Uh, some of those, like, for instance, the one that leaps to mind is uh, go to XY, mm -hmm. was grayed out for a long time. With uh, one of the sketches, it was made active, and there are other things as well. And that kind of leads us to one kind of little bit of a flub that we had in the process. We, uh, we updated the uh, handhelds, we updated the rovers, but we didn't update the innovators because we for whatever reason, that was my job. I thought we were good enough and we had a group come in. One of our challenges was to create a song and they tried to do the new way where you could just type in G or D and I we had used the old sketch where they had to type in the frequency and so they were a little disgruntled for a minute until they figured out that you know, it was a pretty easy easy fix there. But um, that was interesting uh, that you asked that question because it was make sure that you update all of your technology unlike what we did, <laughs> what I did, make sure you, you update everything. And then have there been changes in the devices? The only change that I'm aware of, and I, I don't know that I am fully up to date on this because we're still using the same set of rovers that we received it initially, but there, there was a, a new pen holder that was released. 
That's the only one that I know about. Brad, you know of any others? That's the only one that I know of. Well, moving along with uh, how we walk through this competition. So uh, one of the teams that we had was the hardware team as we started to prepare. And the hardware team, um, their job was to make sure, uh, was to check in and check out the hardware of the teams to make sure that all the devices were updated, which as I mentioned, um, we failed at a part of this, and then make sure all the devices were in good working order and that we had all the necessary cables and everything was fully charged. Um, that was also proved to be a little bit of a thing because we just kind of, as I was setting this up, I just looked for a long cable. And uh, as you know, if you use the rover, there's the charging cable, and then there's also the cable that you plug into the uh, computer and that plugs into the innovator to send a code. And so some of the rovers had, you know, one and some had the charging cable. So it was interesting as we worked through that, but make sure that you check all of those little details out um, that we're telling you now because we made the mistake. Learn from our mistakes. We did learn that charging was extremely important. Uh, the day that we hosted, we showed up to our high school to find that someone had run into a power pole up the highway and there was no power. Yep, pitch black for the first uh, two or three hours that we were here. So luckily we had charged everything the night before and it had been charging until five o'clock that morning when that person had that accident. So everything was pretty well charged, but just a quick caveat, make sure that you plan for those types of things and make sure that you're charging ahead of time. Or just rely on luck. As it happened, the space that we were using had been used the previous evening by the National Honor Society induction, and they had left their candles behind for us. Yep. So we felt very, uh, very like pioneers in that we were setting up our very first Rover challenge by candlelight in a gym here at McAllister High School. So, uh, and, and one of the biggest pieces of this was the challenge development team. Um, and we knew as we worked through this process, we knew we needed to create some challenges, or our, our heart was to create some challenges with the handheld, with the innovator specifically, and with the rover specifically. And we wanted to kind of scaffold those challenges to where anybody that walked in, even if they were just getting the handheld for the first time, could have some success. And so our big thing was we came, we came up with um, some levels. We came up with uh, beginner, inter intermediate, and advanced. And we wanted to make sure that um, anybody that walked in could be challenged and could have the opportunity to uh, be challenged, but also have success. We wanted people to walk away feeling like they uh, had a sense of gratification or a sense of um, completion and that they were able to um, have, uh, have that time where they figured something out and had that aha moment. We, uh, of course, this being the first time to do this, weren't sure about who to expect. So we, as we developed our challenges, we did keep a weather eye on who was registering. Uh, we'd sent out via email and eventually uh, via Eventbrite uh, registration. We kept an eye on uh, who was registering there. I guess it was by a Google form last year, wasn't it? A Google form last year. Uh, we realized early on that we had a larger than expected number of younger students, even some sixth graders mm -hmm. that were registering. So we found it uh, not a challenge, but certainly something to think about to develop challenges that were accessible to students who maybe had less mathematical knowledge, uh, maybe that hadn't played, say, with a random number generator yet, or uh, had much experience with those kinds of issues as we thought about just innovator challenges. Now, not all our challenges were rover challenges. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, I think we split that up with about three handheld, three innovator, and four rover challenges. But one thing that was really cool and kind of the reward for us being intentional with the way we set this up was um, in this competition, our, one of my teams who had a young lady that had a full ride to Brown University actually finished, her team finished first. But the team that finished just 10 points behind them was a group of sixth graders from Rattan, Oklahoma. And you saw that we had 774 people in our high school they probably don't have 774 people in their whole school, K to 12. And so it was really exciting to see that group of sixth graders come in and have almost as much success as a group led by a, an Ivy League full ride scholarship recipient. Um, and, and honestly, you know, they may have gotten more out of it than, than my group did. Um, so we were really excited to see how that worked and see how, how much success they were, they were able to have. Of course, writing the challenges is one thing, but you also need some written descriptions of the challenges so that they can be shared with the teams that are coming in, if that's what you choose to do. Uh, 
as well as to be able to describe the challenges to the judges. As you saw in our gathering support slide before, we did have parents and people from the community that may or may not have had coding or computer challenges and uh, skills of any kind. So, you know, writing uh, plain language descriptions of those challenges became something. That's what we mean be here by creating easy to understand scoring rubrics for each challenge. That was meant for the judges as much as it was for the students. Uh, we ended up with some school board members, some community members, uh, as well as you know some staff members here that were pretty adept with technology. But we had some people that uh, were able using our descriptions to understand that the student should put the rover on the table, it should move forward so far, so much and turn and you know back up or whatever the challenge was uh, in plain language so the judge can understand whether or not that those students were successful. So, um, and in that, you know, Tim mentioned, here's a sample rubric that we wanted to, to lay out for the challenge. So we gave points based on um, maybe not completing the whole task in itself, but completing parts of the task. That way, like I said, um, like we've said multiple times, hey, you know, we want everybody to have the chance to be successful. And so we gave very detailed what, kind of what we expected, um, directions at the bottom. We laid out exactly what all the checkpoints were for points. Um, and so the big piece for that was, for us, was like Tim said, we had a couple of colleagues that had been trained on the rover and the innovator and, and the handheld, the Inspire handheld. And, but, and we had one school board member that's a STEM teacher but the majority of the people they're judging for us, well, and we had a couple of TI coaches there that were judging, but probably half of the people judging for us had probably never seen an innovator or a rover or had never held an Inspire calculator. And so our intent with this was to, to be just very plain and open for them. They needed very clear instructions so they didn't get bogged down in the coding or anything else. So these were uh, two sample codes that we did. Um, the left one was just on the handheld where we wanted them to basically create an average program. Um, there were a couple of different levels of this, but basically it was something that related to them because you know they're students and they get grades all the time. And so it was an easy way for them to create a program to figure out what their test average was or what their average for the class was. And the, the one on the right was creating a bow tie, which was a pretty easy thing for us. It was the first code that we ever learned on the rover. Um, and it was drawing a bow tie with a dry erase marker essentially. And so, um, we shared these two just because um, they were two kind of basic things. Now, our intent is a part of one of the resources that we're going to share is kind of a description of all of our challenges. Um, and these were two of the challenges that we feel like our kids had a lot of success with early on. And, and just about every team completed these two challenges. So um, maybe not to the extent where they used a for loop or whatever else. Um, we even gave them credit on the average one if they said, you know, input three grades and divide by three. Maybe they didn't give it a count variable to divide by, you know, whatever else or didn't do a for loop or however that works. So. Well, certainly in terms of the day and our intent at T cubed, we would like to have handed you a rover at this point and some of the challenges that we have written for our upcoming challenge uh, to, to play it, to play with it hands on. If you go, uh, to the app, you should be able to access descriptions of the challenges that we used last year, as well as some text versions of some of the programs that we used, as well as some scoring, scoring rubrics and other things. You know, if you're interested in jumping off some of the work that we've already done and not have to recreate the wheel from everything, if you're interested in holding a challenge for yourself. And any questions that you have or anything that you feel like that we, uh, didn't cover or anything else, we have here in a couple of slides our contact information and we would love for you to take what we started and make it better. And we'd love for you to take what, our failures and learn from them and not make the same ones and, and just, just run with this thing. So that's our heart. Um, another team that was big was the logistics team as we prepared for the competition. Um, our site, the one that we, uh, that we got to use was basically split up into three areas. There was um, a, the actual uh, testing area, there was a work area, and then there was a gym kind of in the middle that really served as kind of like a brain break buffer area in a lot of ways where kids kind of stopped and took a deep breath when they had frustration or walked out of the room and just kind of paced out there for a minute. Um, 
but a big thing here was uh, first make sure you secure a site that's big enough and I always encourage you to plan bigger rather than smaller as Tim mentioned at the beginning we thought we were going to have six teams and we wound up with 35 or 40 and so um, always plan for bigger than you think um, it's it's okay if you don't feel that that size the first time but um, you know as much as we saw the kids enjoy this eventually you will um, you need to plan on how you're going to set that up you need to arrange your furniture your tables whatever uh, as uh, as necessary for the uh, for the competition uh, be mindful of where the rover is going to drive um, you will see here in just a minute that Tim created some tables that allowed that had some buffers on every side so that our our rovers we can have uh, the testing happening off of the floor it was uh, just a couple of feet off the ground and um, they would not we would not have to worry about them driving off and, and obviously breaking the rovers um, and we made sure that we separated the competition space and the workspace that was incredibly important we wanted the kids when they were testing to basically just test and go part of that was we didn't want them to kind of while collaboration is good in, in terms of a competition we didn't want them to see what another team did and try to steal that and, and you know basically change everything they were doing to, to run with that um, we wanted them to learn and to develop on their own and so we kind of rushed them out of the, the challenge competition back to the work area as quick as possible was having some rules and regulations provided to the coaches was something that we had to think through we realized now that uh, a couple of things we would have changed but generally speaking it it is uh, you know the, the team's coaches their faculty members were there with them but uh, the faculty members didn't need to be touching the devices that was incredibly important and it, as hard as it was for me being a both on the the planning team but also as a coach and I wanted you know I, I needed to be fair from the planning perspective but I wanted to help my kids you know the the big deal was not how much I knew or how much the other adults knew it was how much did our kids know what kind of experience did they get or what they could figure out or what mm -hmm. they could figure out and so two quick questions or two quick uh, things that were posted in the chat window that I want to talk about um, 35 teams was a blessing um, that was about seven or eight schools but we have um, more schools in our area that um, that are uh, that have the rovers and the challenge itself uh, we gave them, I think it was three hours in the morning and three hours after lunch with a one hour lunch break in the middle or a 30 minute lunch break in the middle. So That's it was right. basically a one day challenge, essentially. And we did have some schools that arrived uh, having only owned a single rover. Yeah. Uh, the Rattan team, for instance, that Brett mentioned earlier, the sixth graders that ended up placing second overall, they had that school district had a single rover for the district. I mean, it's a small school site. So, uh, you know, but there are many teams or many schools in Southeast Oklahoma now that have access to rovers or have now borrowed some from us. Yeah, I, and I was going to mention that this year uh, to set up for this year's competition, we were contacted by two or three different schools and we actually created a little mini TI loan program where we loaned them a handful of our rovers or our innovators so that they could use more than one for Red 10 uh, is planning to bring, I think they said 16, which is 18 kids, and it's really hard for 18 kids to manage one rover. So we loaned them, I believe, uh, four or five more rovers so that they could actually each team have uh, a rover to work with on their own. And so that was really that was really exciting um, this year to be able to be kind of that that resource. Um, There's another question in the chat. Uh, our teams were given a rough description of the challenges uh, without much detail. Really, we sent them, and you can find this in our documents on the app, we gave them just a description of the skills that they would need and a, a very, very broad description of the kinds of challenges that they would face. So when students arrived here at McAllister High School the morning of this of our challenge day, it, the challenges were really a surprise. They had no advance notice of what was going to happen apart from Generally, they were going to need to be able to make the rover go back, forth, turn left and right, uh, know how to make the lights blink on the innovator. But there's a list there in our documents if you're interested in looking that up. Uh, and by the way, did we address the question about how long it took? Our our challenge was one day. Yeah. So students arrived, you checked in. We started at nine at noon. They went to lunch. Uh, we asked them to put all their devices away, and we locked the room. We asked them to go away and think, and then come back. And I think we had our award ceremony at 2 or 2.30? Uh, it was 2.30 and 
We just had a 30 minute break where we allowed them to go if they wanted to for 30 and go, go get lunch or they could eat in our little cafeteria and eat wherever they wanted to. And we kind of staggered that and let them, we told them you had like an hour block that you had to take a 30 minute lunch during this hour block. So if they wanted to work for the first 30 minutes of that hour block, because they were in the middle of something, we let them work. And uh, if they wanted to set it down right then and take their 30 minutes and then come back, we let them come back. So they either basically took their lunch at 12 or 1230, but they had to spend 30 minutes away to eat and with no technology around. Oh, uh, the, the app that I keep referring to, and I'm, forgive me, I believe, and this might be a question I need to, to address to Eric Butterball in a minute. Uh, as I understand it, the documents that we uploaded will be available on the, the T-Cubed app, uh, the one that you would have used had we had the T-Cubed conference. That's, that's my understanding, and that app um, should still be available in the Play Store and the iTunes Store. Thank you. And so uh, the, the tables that we were talking about that Tim created, here's a picture of them. Um, the picture on the left is one of our Algebra 1 teachers who definitely is very intrigued about what is going on. And uh, she's, a, she's a neat lady. We, we enjoy working with her. And then the one on the right is Doug Roberts, um, our fearless math leader over the last uh, however many years and has definitely helped us in this process and in a lot of processes well, as our TI coach. Well, certainly without whom none of this would have ever happened. Mm. So uh, we showed you a picture at the beginning of what one of our flyers looked like. And, and just for a quick minute, we want to talk about how we advertise. And so we didn't put a lot of we didn't put a lot of stuff into a lot of money into advertising per se um, ourselves. The the Gear Up grant they put some money into the flyers and some different things like that. And so there was there is some room there where maybe it gets a little bit more cost effective for us uh, costly than it did for us last year. But our big thing was we wanted everybody in the Gear Up in our Gear Up cadre to know that this was a possibility because we knew that the majority of them had access to the rovers. Um, we contacted other schools in our district. Uh, we contacted our middle school, our intermediate school, so fifth through eighth grade, and they both brought a handful of teams, which was exciting for me as the robotics coach because we're preparing the fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders for coding as they get to high school. And then uh, we talked to Doug, we talked to a bunch of different um, TI people and, and asked them to reach out and talk to their people. Um, word of mouth, obviously, and social media. Um, we put it out on our Twitter, we put it out on Facebook, Instagram, everything that we had. Um, I adverti advertisement for this can be very cheap if you have the resources. Um, it's not, I, to be honest with you, I mean, there's, there's a specific group of people that this appeals to, and you, if you know who those people are, then you can get them by social media or email or whatever else. Uh, putting up flyers probably won't be something that, uh, you know, uh, somebody off the street is going to see and say, hey, I want to do that but maybe that inspires them if they go to a different school or even to our school to jump into a robotics program or to try to get one going at their school. So in answer to Heather's question, you're in central Oklahoma. Uh, I think our vision is either you replicate this program yourself or if you're in central Oklahoma, contact Brett or I and bring your team to our place. And uh, Heather also, in addition to that, um, we would love, love, love to, uh, to work with you on anything uh, rover related. We'd love to work with you on maybe a small scale thing. I know Tim said replicate it. We'd love to help you with that. Um, that that's our heart. We want this to happen, especially knowing that you're in Oklahoma. Um, you know, we have the Southeast quote unquote region. Maybe you start this central quote unquote region of this competition and then that's ultimately how it goes. So you see a slide about what we spent. Uh, we didn't spend a great deal of money on the uh, competition itself. Apart from, of course, the equipment that we received, which was a godsend, um, it would have been tough to do without that. Um, we also really need to, you know, give shout outs to folk like uh, Dave Santucci, who helped us by spurring us along with equipment and ideas and in workshop loan to uh, get our STEM camp and our competition started. Well, and even uh, Eric Butterbaugh, our host, he was in on a couple of our conference calls that helped give us some ideas and helped kind of guide us in, in, in a way to do this. So shout out to a lot of the TI people that came alongside us and worked with us on that. So um, one of the most important pieces of this uh, was that we feel like was to meet with our judges ahead of time. 
we wanted to uh, model the challenges. And one important piece that I'm going to encourage you with is if you are the one that is, in, that is in charge of the challenge, go write the code yourself. So you understand the challenge. You understand if what you're asking is possible. And don't do this just copying and pasting. Make sure that you can write the code. Because if you can't write the code and you're supposed to be the expert, they can't probably can't write the code either. Or they're going to struggle with it. So it was incredibly important that we modeled each challenge so the, the judges knew exactly what to look for. Again, we showed you a copy of the rubric that gave a very detailed um, expectation of what the rover or whatever should do. We talked to them about how to award the points, and we talked to them about the leveling system. And the most important piece of this is we had them ask us questions because we knew they weren't going to understand something. We wanted them to have a, a very comprehensive understanding of what was happening uh, in their little area. And we gave them just one challenge. We didn't really try to rotate them very much. We wanted them to understand what was going on at their station. They didn't need to know what was going on at the other nine stations. They just needed to understand what was going on at their station. And that was incredibly, incredibly important to us. Now, we opted to meet with our judges. As, as I said, our, our competition started at nine. We met with our judges that morning. Uh, some of those folks had taken a day off work to come and work with us. So we wanted to be very respectful of their time. Uh, perhaps we might have had some evening meetings beforehand. A handful of our judges we were able to meet with beforehand because they were on our staff. Mm -hmm. Two of them, or three, three of them, three I guess. Them. Uh, the others we opted to meet with that morning. And as I said, we had, we had everything programmed and we showed the judge what it should look like on the device, on the rover, or you know, just on the handheld for those handheld-only challenges. And just a quick little suggestion as, as we kind of move on to the next slide real quick. Um, I would suggest that you do meet the night before so you have a little bit more time. We were a little bit crunched with our time because with the power being out, we were scrambling, and that was part of a contingency plan we wish we would have kind of planned a little bit ahead of time. We also were intentional about meeting with our scorekeepers. Uh, we talked about how to, how to record the score. We talked about how the points were going to be told cumulatively. cumulatively um, we needed to talk about how they were going to utilize the volunteers that we had that served as runners to run and collect the scores from the coaches and take them to our, our actual scoring table. And then we had a kind of a really cool way to um, talk about placing. And, and this was Tim's idea, and I was not privy to this as a coach, and, and rightfully so. It really wasn't my idea. I just robbed it from having been the scorekeeper tabulator at a cheer competition at some point. Uh, we did decide, since we had such a wide age range of students who came to our competition, and we had sixth graders through seniors, uh, some of those were you know, in sixth grade math and others were sitting at a coding class. So uh, as you saw, we had challenges that had a pretty low entry point that were not very much different than just the uh, TI codes or 10 minutes of code challenges, but we added components to them to make them more challenging so that those students who were a little more advanced could earn more points if they could you know, add some uh, different wrinkles to their, <clears throat> excuse me, to the challenge that they were working on at that point. So uh, once all the points were accrued, we had already uh, decided we were going to do three levels. Uh, there was going to be a, a beginner's champion, if you will, an intermediate level champion and an advanced champion. We had, uh, of course, the appropriate ribbons or trophies or plaques um, pre-made for those, uh, those levels. And we just looked for natural breaks in uh, the points that students were able to accrue and assign them there. Now, we did ask them as they registered to rate themselves as beginner team, an intermediate team, or an advanced team, but we didn't hold our people to that, that level. Uh, some people didn't have a sense of you know, their student skill as compared to other students uh, from other schools. So we left that open to interpretation for ourselves. And the big thing, let your scorekeepers ask questions because they need to we need, if you let them ask questions ahead of time, that solves a lot of problems for you as the, the coordinator or the coordinators. Um, let them ask questions, and obviously there'll still be questions that they don't know to ask at that point, but let them ask questions. We have a question about uh, partnering with the local Girl Scout troop. Uh, you know, actually we had all kinds of folk that uh, came to the competition and also supported the competition 
from all kinds of walks. Uh, you know, we had a gentleman who works at a local hospital who just was interested as support. But we also had, of course, some students that were sitting at a coding class that brought a team. But we had other people that just had a coding club after school or a TI Rover club that met outside of school or after school. So I'm not sure if you, uh, whoever asked the question about the Girl Scout troop, if you intended for them to be involved in the competition as participants or in a support role. But I think that could be beautiful either way. And definitely something that we can reach out to this year um, with our competition coming up in about three weeks. Um, definitely a, a, a contact that we can make for sure. And we had a question about uh, an algebra teacher uh, yes, certainly we had some folks that were including coding uh, in some geometry classes and some algebra classes and some pre-calculus classes uh, at, at various levels and in various ways. That uh, that would be a an hour-long discussion or a six-hour-long discussion all by itself. Uh, I, I'm going to have to walk away from that or we're going to use up all our time. <laughs> yeah. Um, just one quick little thing I can give you on that. One of our teachers uses uh, uses a bell ringer time, and she maybe gives one skill and goes over it for about five or ten minutes once or twice a week. Um, but the, the score sheet that we have here, this was a sample of the score sheet. So we had ten challenges. And you saw how the scoring worked. Each challenge had kind of three levels for uh, kind of almost complete, kind of sort of almost there, and then completed. And then if they completed the challenge, uh, the first time or there was a certain level of accuracy they got bonus points available and so this is kind of how we kept track of this we had a, a, a google uh, sheets form that we had set up with all the teams and all the team members that way they knew who they were there was no mixing up um, you know billy johnny and susie were on this team and no matter you know how many times they went back they scored for this team because they were registered as part of this team this was a really easy way for us to keep track of points so I, I, okay, I can't walk away. The um, the whole business of you know, the teachers using coding in their classrooms, most of the time, and in fact, Brett and I will be doing a webinar in a month or so uh, about how various teachers in our cadre have used coding, used Rover, used Innovator uh, in algebra, geometry, trigonometry, and calculus classes. Uh, you might look for that as one of the regular webinars that's coming up. So uh, the day of, uh, as far as the competition goes, when we got ready to set up, we talked about a lot of this um, already, but just to kind of harp on a couple of things, uh, make sure your areas are, are separated. We talked about why. Make sure one thing that we didn't talk about in the, the work area, we kind of set up a model of the uh, rover challenges, of the innovator challenges, of whatever um, really, it was just the rover challenges. That way, they could get a grasp of the scope and the, the how the challenge kind of worked, and they could practice before they ran into the test area. Um, and again, we talked about making sure that the coaches don't coach. Um, it's okay to kind of guide maybe a little bit, but um, there may have been a time or two where we saw a coach with a hand held in their hand, and that's not that was not the goal of the of the task, obviously. So make sure that the the um, if you have a monitor. Uh, and we suggest that you have a monitor, um, make sure they're adept enough at the coding to help kind of guide that, but without giving away the answer, they can answer the questions in a, in a, a real way for the students that can guide them to where they're trying to get, but not give them the exact answer. That's incredibly important as well. Oh, I agree. Uh, I noticed Brett said the students run back into the test area. I was amazed as I got to be the monitor, I was amazed at how excited students were to get back in there and and uh, show the judges what they could do. I don't think we made this clear before. We gave students multiple opportunities to complete a challenge. Yeah. It wasn't uh, they have this challenge. They could go have their their uh, challenge judged. And for instance, if they only earned 20 points, if they thought they could uh, you know move to the next level and get their 40 point challenge done, they were free to do so. Now, a couple of the bonuses were only were like the bonus was did you get it right the first time? or the bonus was did were you a certain level of accuracy. And so the bonus, obviously, if you got it right the first time, is only available the first time. But they could come back and get one of the three levels, go up a level on any of the challenges as many times as they wanted. And so part of it taught time management and how to kind of manage your workload as well, because they had to kind of strategize on how they were going to score points and, and all that stuff. They wanted to make sure that they had an opportunity to, um, to score, but also, you know, to um, move up and move on. 
we also uh, did not sort of preconceive the order in which students would do challenges. The students just got the full challenge list when they walked in, and they had freedom to choose, you know, the more difficult high point challenges or really uh, quick low point challenges. We had some teams that opted to do a number of challenges that had a relatively low point value, but that they could do several of in 30 minutes. Uh, other teams went directly to the high point challenges and worked on them uh, for a lengthy amount of time. And uh, part of the scoring that we didn't mention was we had some tiebreaker competitions that we built. Um, we had three of them. Uh, one of them were really cool ones that we had that we used. We had them um, draw a time like as if they were the arms of a clock and we gave them a random time. I think it was like 913 or something like that. And then we had them, uh, we had an escape room challenge for the Roper built as well. That was really cool. As far as distributing and collecting the equipment, we kind of made a joke about this, but don't do what we did. And the reason we say that is this. Um, what we had was we had our piles of rovers and innovators and all of that stuff. And in my infinite wisdom, thought it would be efficient enough to have the teams, when we get ready to start, just walk up, grab their stuff, and walk back. Walk up, grab their stuff. Well, planning for six teams, that wouldn't have taken that much time. However, when 35 teams showed up, that took an enormous amount of time and cut into some of the competition time. And so this year, what we've kind of decided to do is we're going to create stations that are going to have, um, we're going to hand the team their number and say, you're number one, go to this station. And it's already going to have all the equipment there at that station. So uh, I, that was my, that's our suggestion. If you're going to do something like this, have it already set up ahead of time because you're going to waste a lot of good um, challenge time where kids can be working and learning and, and being challenged. Um, you're going to waste that time just handing gear out. And really the kids, you know, they were just sitting there and they were kind of bored for the first 30 minutes or so, because that's how long it took us to hand this stuff out, because we told them they couldn't, they couldn't start. So it was like, you know, they were just eager and ready to go, and they, they couldn't, because we didn't give them the go-ahead. So um, just a, a, a quick thing there, don't, don't do that. Make sure everything's set up ahead of time. So uh, what questions do you have for us? You've asked a couple in the chat window. Um, if there's anything else that's come up to mind, uh, come to mind, we'd love to try to answer that with our last few minutes here. We have about seven minutes left. Um, we'd love to answer any questions that you've got that's related to this or anything that, that we've talked about. We'd love to answer those questions for you. I really love the idea of uh, the problem solving day. We have um, puzzle problem day here in the algebra and geometry classes here at McAllister High School where students do some um, fairly challenging open-ended questions. I know that just right before Christmas, uh, one of our geometry teachers was uh, in one of the geometry classes was teaching uh, exterior angles. So she used Rover there to ask students to draw a diagram where they needed to figure exterior angles um, and really didn't uh, do a ton of pre-lecture, uh, just you know, gave students opportunities in the coding or in the experience to figure out how exterior angles of polygons worked uh, just through their hands-on experience. I know that they had a great time. And in that same vein, um, just this past week, one of our teachers, uh, probably the same teacher, um, I, I wrote a code for her that required the students to discover um, how to create a five-pointed star with the rover, which is something that we picked up along the way. Um, and so it made kids experience, uh, again, exterior angles. It made kids experience, um, they had to determine whether to turn right or left to complete it. They had to uh, figure out that um, the number of turns and not the number of points was not the same as the number of points. So there was a lot of exploration there and just kind of, and, and basically she just gave them the code that said, how many turns do you want to make? At what degree do you want to make uh, the turn? And um, do you want to turn right or left? And the kids just got to play. They got to play with different degrees. You know, naturally you're going to think 60 and 60 wouldn't have got it there. They would have had to pick 120, so on and so forth. And so, um, you know, different aspects of that. Uh, Kathy, your question, what were the challenges? Uh, that's going to be uh, one of the resources that we post. It's going to be the, the detailed description of um, each challenge, each judge scoring rubric um, that we gave each one of our judges. Um, there's also going to be kind of how we set each one of those things up. And so uh, some of them, like Tim said, were just straight out of the, the 10 minutes of code. Um, and some of them were uh, an added variation to that. So. So the challenges, we, we had 10, actually we had 12 that we, we had 10 regular challenges and two tiebreaker challenges. Uh, they are in the materials 
So they went from uh, a simple coding challenge, it was handheld only like to average some grades that the judge had uh, up to an escape room where the rover was put into a box that had a hole cut in the side and it had to find its way out. Uh, we based initially our work off the 10 minutes of code. We believed at first we wanted to write some more difficult challenges, but decided that um, sort of taking the 10 minutes of code experience that most of the students probably had and most of the teachers were comfortable with, and honestly that was our primary concern is that uh, faculty members would be reticent to bring students to a challenge that they themselves weren't comfortable with. So we, uh, we did uh, take the 10 minutes of challenge codes and go two or three steps further so uh, it was accessible to them. How many students per rover? Uh, ideally, I'd like to have two students per rover. Um, in our challenge, we use three, uh, just because of the rovers that we have in the space in a classroom. I very often use three students per rover. What do you say, Brett? I was going to say a general rule of thumb for us here is, is three, usually. Um, and, you know, two, two is ideal, but like Tim said, just based on um, the size of the classrooms and whatnot, generally three work, has worked best for us here. Well, you see our emails and Twitter handles on the screen right now. Please uh, feel free to email Brett. He will help you anytime, or myself. I, I was just kind of throwing him under the bus there. Uh, we do have a pretty busy schedule, but we uh, really work hard to get back with folks that contact us with questions as quickly as we possibly can. We do have uh, full teaching schedules, both of us, as well as other responsibilities. If you don't hear back from us in a day, uh, don't be offended, please. But uh, Email me again. Yeah, we, we won't feel like you're badgering us if, if your email has, for some reason, fallen off our home screen. Any other questions as we run out of time here? Well, and I will tell you that, that, again, to echo what Tim said, our heart is for you guys to have the opportunity to do this. And I just want to encourage you, again, wherever you are on your TI journey, wherever you are as far as the demographics of your school, wherever you are as far as the equipment that you have. Um, uh, Dave Santucci mentioned that you can contact um, the, the STEM team at TI to work with the work loan program. The equipment shouldn't be an issue, but wherever you stand, we'll help you. I know your coaches, if you have them, will help you. There are so many resources out there to help you. So if you want to do this, it is, it, it, it is a, an option for you. You absolutely can do this wherever you are in your walk. So please understand that we are encouraging you to do this. This is not something that's just unique to Southeastern Oklahoma or unique to us. It, it, it would just tickle us that in the next year we have a hundred of these competitions going on. So, um, you know, please, 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 let's make this thing happen. I agree. Uh, still, if you can contact us, if you want to come to our competition, if you're close enough, contact us soon. We'll get you that information. Absolutely. And Eric, I'm going to pass the ball back to you, sir. Great. Thank you both, uh, Tim and Brett, so, so much for sharing your, your expertise and enthusiasm this, this afternoon. And um, really, what a great way to highlight students' teamwork and problem-solving skills. Um, and it, it looks like it really gave students an opportunity to shine and to sh share their work not only with, um, with their peers, but also with adults, which, which I think is, is really important for students. 